Hey, Three Creeks, and welcome to Three Creeks Church Online. We hope this message is helpful for you. We hope that it encourages you and challenges you. Uh, hey, we have a strong conviction here at Three Creeks that we don't want this to be a replacement for being in person in church. So if you live in the Columbus area, we'd love to see you at Three Creeks every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock at Gehanna Middle School West. If you're not from the Columbus area, uh, we want you very badly to, to be plugged into a local church where you are at. So we hope this message is helpful, but we hope that it's not a replacement for being with a church family on a Sunday morning. We hope that is your experience. We're in a series called Psalm 23. And so for four weeks, we're going to sit in these six verses. We're not going to rush on to the next thing. We've got nowhere else to be. And so we hope that as we go through very slowly, that this refreshes your soul, like David wrote in Psalm 23. If you believe in our vision to help people to find and follow God, we invite you to give online. You can go to threecreekchurch.com and you can do that right there. Thanks to, to those of you who give, thank you. And we would like to invite you to do so now. And here we go, Psalm 23. Now, before we, we dive into talking about the dinner table, I want to do a small, quick recap uh, of what we've gone through thus far. I mean, this passage start off with David saying, or declaring rather, that the Lord is his shepherd. And that's something that could easily be glazed over, and I won't go into detail as to why, but the reality is that if Jesus isn't your shepherd, we would be silly to think that someone else or something else isn't. We were a people that were created by God, for God, and we were created to be led. And I would say this, if Jesus is not your shepherd, then for sure there is some, someone else or something else that is someone else's opinion, someone else's position, some kind of internal desire. Or if we're truly honest, some of us would say, like, I lead my own life. Like, I'm in charge of my life. I call the shots. And if that is the case for you today, I would look at you and say, congratulations, you are your shepherd. And if you were writing your 23rd Psalm, it would probably read something in the first two lines like this. I am my shepherd, and I can guarantee you this. The next line will, will not be something of like, like in, I lack nothing, but rather it'll be, I am my shepherd, and I have many wants. Because let's, let's be honest. When we, are, when we tend to lead or rule or try to run and navigate our lives, things just do not go well. We were created by God, for God, to be led by him. And when we read through this passage, I mean, all of us have been given the opportunity to lean in to allow Jesus. We all have that opportunity to lean in and allow Jesus to shepherd us. And let's read through a little bit of, of what we get or what that looks like when Jesus is our shepherd. It tells us in Psalm 23 that there will be rest in green pastures and still waters. There will be restoration for our souls. Uh, there will be guidance along the right paths. Even when we are in the darkest times of our lives, we can rest assured that we're not there alone, that God meets us in that place. And it goes on and on from there. Like that's the truth that we could lean in and have if we allow Jesus 
to be our shepherd. We're going to take a look into verse 5 of this passage. Psalms 23, verse 5, and it simply says this, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflowed. I heard a pastor phrase it like this. He said, if he was writing this verse in this 23rd Psalm, he would write it completely different, differently. And I can't agree with him anymore. Like, if I was writing this particular verse in this passage, I would probably write it and say something like, you prepare a table before me in your presence, period. Forget the enemies. Like, get them far away from me. I don't want, like... You prepare a table before me in your, par- your presence, period. Lord, that's where I want to be. But we know that's not the case. And for many of us who've been walking with the Lord for some times, we know that that's not even how he operates. God in this passage here through David is saying, like, I'm not going to extract you out of your situations. I'm not going to remove you from it. Rather, what I'm going to do is in the thick of the hardship of everything that's going on in your life, whether it be circumstances, whether it be arrows that fly by day and by night causing just affliction, whether there be persecution or difficulties that you may be struggling with, if there's a diagnosis of cancer or a miscarriage or any family strife, God is saying, like, I am going to prepare a table in the right smack dab in the middle of that that I'm inviting you to come and dine with me. And going further in the passage, it says, you anoint my head with oil. Oil, anointing of the head back then was just symbolism of like setting one apart. Like, so what, what God is saying in the midst of, not only am I preparing this table, this lovely feast, in the midst of all your circumstances and your situations that seem to be coming at you from every angle, but as you sit and dine with me, I'm going to remind you of who you are in me. I am going to do just that of refreshing your soul. I am going to yet again affirm you of your your sonship or your daughtership in me. This is what you can expect at the table. And let's just imagine, let's put this into perspective. I mean, this, what I have here is just so small and doesn't even compare to what I really believe this time would be. But we're, we're talking about the God of the universe right? The one who knows every, has numbered every hair or strand of hair on your head, the one who knitted you in your mother's womb, the, the, the creator of your soul, the one who knows you better than anybody that you can probably think of or fathom, is saying, come, come dine with me. In the midst of your enemies scattered about all around you, come dine with me. And in my mind, I just imagine that I'm, I'm taking a seat here, and, and God is on that side there, and he essentially pours me a drink. And as he pours me a drink, he's sincerely asking me, John, how are you? And we know, like, people ask us every day, like, hey, how are you doing? And we understand that that's like a formality of just like, they really don't want to know how you're doing. They're just asking it. But like, The one who knows your soul is just asking you, how are you doing? Like, no, really, how are you? Like, and and mind you, we're surrounded by all of the circumstances and the situations that have bogged us down, but we're here, and the creator of my soul is affirming me and loving me and showing me how much he values me here in this moment. And for a second or a time there, the enemies just seem small. Like, we don't, we don't discredit them or act or sweep under the rug like they're not there. They're there, and they're very much so real instances. But in this moment, this intimate time with me and the Father, like, I have this moment, this space to be affirmed in my identity in him at this table that he has prepared for me. I would say this, as lovely as this is, and it's great, the reality is that the enemy desires to have a seat at your table. The enemy desires to have a seat at your table, and you, can't, you just can't give it to him. 
You can't give it to them. It's a, it's a simple truth this morning, but I, I want us to really grasp and understand that this morning. Ways that we give the enemy a seat at our table, it, it varies. I'm going to talk about just very, two very simple ways this morning that I, I feel like it plays itself out. But the first way is this, is that we're so busy with the things in life that we don't even accept the invitation to come and sit and, di- and dine with the Father. Simply put, we're just too busy, right? We're too busy. Like our Western culture here, and we've talked about this before in other messages, of just like us as Americans, we wear busyness as like a, a badge of honor, right? Like someone comes up and asks you, hey, so-and-so, how you doing? Well, you know, just real busy. Just life is just, it's bit, like we say that, like it's like this, this thing that you should be celebrating. And let me say this. I, I realize that there are seasons of life where busyness is real, right? Like life is just busy. But I don't want us to become a people where we get so set in that that it becomes like our norm. Like there is rest and peace to be had in Christ that we can have. That busyness should not be the model. Like how I, I imagine that people would really be caught off guard if you were to ask them, like, hey, how you doing? And you're just like, man, I'm just resting so well in Christ right now. Like, people would genuinely be thrown off guard by that. But that's rarely, I, I've, I've asked the question, how are you, a lot of times, and I could tell you, I've, I've never really heard that. Um, people are just, we're, we're just so prone to busyness. And, and in this table that has been set, like I imagine I mean, the Father is there, the invitation is set, the table is spread out. We have this amazing feast, but we, we come in and we're like, God, whoa, you really outdid yourself. Man, grapes, blueberries, this is, this is amazing. I'm thirsty. I am not hydrated myself at all. This is great. Thank, thank you so much. Like, I really wish I could stay, but I can't, like, I got this meeting I got to run to. Joel's got me doing some crazy stuff. <laughs> uh, again. But, but it's okay. Like, thank you so much for this. I, I can't leave, though, without getting a little screenshot of this. <laughs> so I'm going to take a picture there. You can do a little selfie. <laughs> I mean, essentially, that's what it looks like, right? Like, we're so busy that we don't even take time to sit at the place where restoration can take place, where peace can be had, where the lover of our soul, the creator of our soul can speak life into us. We, we punt on that, chasing after things that ultimately leave us discontent, exhausted, and discouraged. We're just simply too busy. And the enemy has a way, I mean, that's the easy way. The enemy goes like, that's the easy win. They even take a seat at the table. The place that was really like made and created to benefit them in a way and to glorify him, that they just that's easy. But we find ourselves being so busy in life that we we punt and we miss the opportunity to sit and dine at the table that God has prepared for us. Another way, the second way or the last way I'll just talk about that we allow the enemy to get a place at or a seat at the table is that we tend to focus on our surroundings, the surrounding enemies, rather than the one who prepared the table. As I stated, like in the verse talks about, there's enemies all around me. And God says smack dab in the middle, I'm, I'm going to create this intimate time for you and I to share. And it's, it's funny because when we find ourselves accepting the invitation, but we're distracted by the enemies, I'm, I'm reminded of, have you ever gone out to eat, like, at a restaurant? My wife and I, we go on date nights often, and it's so crazy, and I'm, I'm not picking at these people because it's something that I personally even had to work through myself, but it is crazy that I, I it seems like there's a table for two, uh, boyfriend and girlfriend or spouses, they're out to dinner, and they're literally sitting across from each other like this, like, and, and you think, to myself, I go, well, maybe there's something they need to check real quick. But when it lasts for, like, half of the dinner, you're like, what, what was the point? You could have got a kid's cuisine and stayed at home. Or, like, I, I, it just doesn't make sense. But, 
But that's what we, in a, in a, in a way, that's what we look like when we're, we accept the invitation at the table. But rather than like being focused and fixed on, on Christ, I'm, I'm here. I'm, and even in that space where I'm looking around and so fixed on my problems, my circumstances, my situations, like just accepting this invitation to sit down. Yeah, that's great, but like in a way that's just like half the battle. Like I need to be locked in, eyes fixed on the one who is able to restore my soul. The Bible speaks very clearly about the intentions and the schemes of the enemy. Like it's, we don't have to go searching or trying to find out like, man, what is he trying to do? Like the Bible actually speaks very openly about the tricks and schemes of the enemy. Just a few verses from the Bible that does that. John 10.10 10 says this, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We've heard that. Genesis 3.1 describes him as being the most craftiest, cunning, cunning beast like of the field. And 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. It's not like a mystery as to like the tricks and the schemes of the enemy. But I feel like when we read these passages or we read these scriptures here in the Bible, one of two things happen. Either we, we write them off or ignore them because it starts getting like a little spiritual and like weird. And it's like, man, I, I don't want to talk about that. And so we just sweep it under the rug like, okay, whatever. Or for some of us, it's just we're paralyzed out of just lack of knowledge as to how this presents itself in our present day, in our everyday walk of life. Like, let's look back at John 10.10 10 and Genesis 3.1, because in those two scriptures right there, we find out the devil's mission, like the enemy's mission, and it's, we're given an adjective in describing how he plans to carry that out, or how he goes about doing it. And so John 10.10, 10, obviously, we say, it says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay, we got that. That's his mission. And then the adjective in Genesis 3.1 says that he's cunning, that he's crafty. But it's crazy because we'll read John 10.10 10 and think sociologically like the devil's going to be like, hey, let me, uh, I'm going to come up to you and I'm going to bash this over your head. This is how I'm going to destroy you. And that's like, that's not the case. If he, he's definitely come to still kill and destroy, but we cannot negate the fact that he's going to be crafty at it. He's going to be like very cunning in how he approaches it. And it's, it's super subtle. But I would say this, if you don't, if you're not aware of it, it's so easy to miss. It's so easy to miss. And then we get caught up as a people like wrestling or being angry at one another. When scripture clearly tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Like, but we'll, 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 oh, well, so-and-so, like they just upset me and this and that. Like, it's real subtle in how it plays itself out. Like you could be literally at the table with the king and enemy just, hey, hey, can I, I have a seat here? Thanks. Uh, you mind if I, if I get a drink here? Uh. And he'll ask questions like the father, like, so you good? How you, how you doing, man? Yeah. How's, how's work? How's, how's home? How's home life? He's, Wife still, wife still nagging. Yeah. Ooh. That's, that's you. She, you did tell her that you've been working all day, right? Like, she's been at home with the kids, but you've been, like, working. Like, what? I don't know. I, couldn't be me. That's you, though. You, you got it. I mean, hey, if it was me, I, 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 I couldn't do it. But, hey, you do you, man. You, you do, like, super subtle, real subtle. Or you can flip the script, like, for our, our wives, like, hey, like, how you doing? You good? Like, husband still is not helping when he come home from work? Yeah. You've literally been at home. I know. You've been at home all day with three kids. The least he could do is just ask you how you doing. You know, Brittany's husband, Jacob, like, he carves out. X amount of time to, you know, ask her intentionally how she's doing. But yeah, you, you're stuck with him. I mean, and, and you know, right, 
you, you know comparison is just like the thief of just like, like it, it just kills or breeds like dysfunction. And so like, yeah, Brittany's husband, Jacob, like, you know, but you, you stuck with John. And so, hey, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I, I couldn't do it, but I guess you're fit to do it. And then these thoughts just start to creep in and whether me sitting here, looking here, just ever so slightly, I go from here and I'm turning and this begins to be the loudest voice that I hear at the table, right? Or job, how, how's work? Work good? You, the boss still acting silly? Bro, they never valued, valued you. Why are you still there? Like, if it was me, I would go in and I would just snap on everybody. And you would be well in your right to do, like, just very subtle. Can I, I, I want to share with you just how that's played itself out in my own personal life. I'm going to let you in on, like, my table with the Lord and, like, how the enemy, I feel like, has approached our intimate dining time. This is John here. 32, huh? Connections, Pastor? <laughs> you, like, beyond, do you really know what you're doing? Like, you're, like you, are you, do you think you can, like, lead people, like, older than you? 30, 32 connections? Okay. How's the church? Congregation, racially? You know, you've seen, there's a lot of white people there. Like a lot, a lot. I mean, the whole situation screams like token black guy. But hey, if he called you, I mean, who am I to say anything? And if I'm not careful, again, this, this becomes the voice that I listen to. So when I come here on a Sunday morning, and I know for a fact that God has called me to lead this church in a way that he's called me to do it, but that's the voice that I'm hearing. I come here, and little small things just set me off. Little things start to get to me. I'm not operating out of kindness. I'm a little flustered and frustrated, so I'm easily triggered. But the table has been set. And I can't, like, there's not much I could do. Well, we'll talk a little bit later. There is some things I could do, but, like, if I'm not careful... This becomes the voice that I listen to the most. And all my actions filter out of that. Rather than like hearing this voice and this affirmation of who he says that I am, because he's the only one that has like the authority to stamp like any approval of my identity and tell me who I am. When I'm focused here, like I'm able to clearly and confidently walk in who God has called me to be, despite my circumstances and my situations that are going on around me. The enemy desires to have a seat at your table and you can't give it to him. You can't give it to him. Revelations chapter 12, verse 10 through 11, this was like so eye-opening for me. We had a deeper weekend not too long ago and it was really hinged upon, uh, like the topic of it was breaking strongholds. And man, it was a, an amazing, life-changing experience. I will never forget that moment in my journey with the Lord. And we, we came across this passage and it really opened my eyes up to like really be aware of how the enemy tries to budge his way up to this table in my life. Like it really opened my eyes to it. Revelation 12 verse 10 through 11 says this, then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers and sisters have been thrown down to the earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimonies. Now, honestly, when I read this, it was crazy because it really gave me insight on two things. One of them I had already heard before, but it was a good reminder. But the first one that I found out through reading this verse, I was like, wow, like this is crazy. In this passage, essentially it's telling us that the accuser, the enemy, is hurling accusations at us, what the pastor says, day and night. 
day and night. That's like all day, just in, like accusations of who you're not, like trying to get you discouraged to believe something about God that's not true of his character and believe something about yourself that he never said that you were. These things are being hurled at us day and night. And the crazy thing is, and, and how, why it was eye-opening to me is like, man, instantly in my head, I'm like, am I even aware of this? Like how, I don't think I'm a, as aware as I need to be of this like spiritual battle that's going on, of these accusations being hurled at me day and night. But I love how overwhelming that this could be if it was just verse 10. I love that verse 11 comes and just, I mean, you can instantly rest in the victory that we have. And it says, and they defeated him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimonies. We defeat the lies and the accusations of the devil through banking on the merits of Christ's death, his death on the cross for us, and sharing the work that he is doing in our lives with other people. That we can have joy and contentment in those two things, the blood of the lamb through Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for us, and the sharing of the work that Jesus is doing in our lives. If that's you this morning, and you're sitting here just saying, like, John, that's me. Like, I find myself in situations where my eyes are drifting from the one who's prepared this table for me onto the lies or my circumstances or the arrows by day or this diagnosis that I just found out yesterday or family situations that is just causing strife. Like, if you find yourself in a situation where that's you, I think, one, we got to make sure that we, we're aware of how the enemy chooses to attack, to attack us. And then I want to share with us just how we can remain focused at this table. Like this wonderful place that God has set for us to dine with him and be refreshed in our soul and be like reaffirmed in who he says we are as a son and as a daughter of him. Like how do we remain focused when the enemy wants to pull a seat up to the table and hurl accusations by day and by night. Three ways that I believe has helped me personally, and I don't think for some of us this may not be new stuff, but my hope is that when we leave out of here today, that one, we can be grateful for this table and the assurance that we know that even in the midst of our enemies surrounding us, that we have this table where God is with us and has invited us and wants to restore us that we could be content and so happy and rejoice in that, but two, that we can be aware of the tax and the schemes of the enemy to be able to stand against that. And there there are three ways that I think are, are valuable for us to hear about this morning that we could even now begin to walk in as we go about the rest of our week this week. But how do we remain focused at the table? First one is, we got to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That means every accusation that is hurled my way, like I got I to gotta take that, line it up with the word of God and what he says, and believe that over this lie. If it doesn't line up with this, that's I can't, I can't believe in that. I can't walk in that. I shouldn't allow that to define me. We got to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And, and now I don't do this personally, but I have had so many friends that have said, like just journaling, like just writing out, or even the acknowledgement of, I feel as if I'm not enough. And because I feel that I'm not enough, I do X, Y, and Z. Like, just being completely honest with where you are, but then on the flip side of that, maybe at the bottom of that, like, writing out that, like, in you, I am enough. In you, you say that I'm a new creation, that the old is gone, the new has come. Like, I am not my failures. I am not my past mistakes. Like, being able to write those things out with Scripture, I know it's often called two truths and a lie, but I'm like, let's up that. Let's do three, three truths to the lie, one lie that we tend to believe about ourselves. 
I think is a very practical way that we could take our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ and keep the enemy from our table. Second way we can remain focused at the table is this. James 4, 7 talks about resisting the devil. Resist the, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And it's crazy because I feel like a lot of times, at least I'll, I'll talk about myself, I, I would read that and I would imagine like me resisting the devil is like this hard, me ignoring him real hard. Like he's sitting here and I'm just like, oh, no, mm-mm. But I, I mean, if we were to look up the definition of resist, I would imagine that it's like, it's some type of like force that's met there. It's this awareness of like something that's happening and taking place. It's not this like ignore, because the accusations are going to come. And although like I'm, my, my back may be turned, my ears are very well so, like I, I could hear. And it may take a little longer, but I feel like over time, this hard annoyance comes and I'm still, I'm back in this situation. So what does it look like to resist the devil? I, again, at this deeper weekend that we were at, uh, we got to like sort of talk in depth about this. And a lot of times I think we look at it as it's like, what is it? How, How do we do it? A lot of times it's just the acknowledgement of like, I see you, right? Like, I see what you're, you're trying to do here. And I want you to know that it's not, that's, it's not going to work. I know who I am in Christ and I'm choosing, like, it's this hard acknowledgement to the enemy, like, I see you, but stop playing with me. <laughs> stop, stop playing with me. And I think that's okay, like, to resist the devil in that way, like, that's what it looks like. I see you and I want to remind you that you have no place here at my table. And I focus back on the one who has prepared the table for me, who brings about restoration to my soul and validates me in all in who he's called me to be. And the last one here has been like literally, like I've been sitting, anybody who's probably been around me, I've done like so many devos here recently on this passage because it has been like the hallmark of where I find myself at currently in my walk with the Lord. Like I'm, I'm in this situation with my walk with the Lord where all these insecurities are flaring up. As I talked about there, like, you're just, you're young. You're, you're young, like, you're in a space where a lot of people don't look like you, and, like, are you sure, like, that's what he caught, like, I, it's just so many insecurities that I have rising up right now, and, like, I feel like God has been screaming at me in this season of life of, like, fix your eyes and your thoughts on me, John, on me. Right now, you're focused on all these circumstances, these enemies, these situations around you, and you wonder why you find yourself in this this discontentment or just like exhausted or drained. Fix your eyes on me. Isaiah 26.3 says that he would keep those in perfect peace who keep their eyes or keep their minds fixed on him and who trust in him. And church, I cannot tell you that has been like the cry of my heart as I've just been doing life with the Lord for these past couple months, that I would sit here at this table and despite the accusations that are hurling my way, that I would keep my eyes fixated on the one who, again, the problems are all around me, but he's greater than it all. And if I can keep my eyes fixed on him, if I can allow his voice to be the loudest thing that I hear, that I could sit and be restored, that I could be refreshed, that even in the moments where I feel like, man, I am so bogged down by so many things, like, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I could sit and hear those things and be so content. He would keep those in perfect peace. And that peace, a lot of times we like to think about it as we're kicking ourselves, like kicking our feet back on vacation out at some resort. But like peace can be had in the midst of the chaos that we always find ourselves in. Like that's available here at the table. Again, mind you, God said, I'm not going to pull you out of your situation. Whether I'm, I'm going to come right in the smack dab middle of everything that's weighing you down. And I'm going to invite you 
to come and sit with me. To come and feast with me. As we wrap up this message series, I essentially want to ask us two questions. The first one is this. We talked about, I mean, all of the benefits of allowing God to be your shepherd, we've talked about in depthly, we've walked through it. But the first question is simply this, like, will you allow the Lord to be your shepherd? If you're here this morning and you can't answer that truly to say, like, God is my shepherd, he's the one leading me, I just want to, like, present that opportunity to you, understanding that the work has been done through him, that in Christ we have the victory. Scripture tells us that for any of those who believe in the Lord, that you confess him as Lord and believe that he died on the cross, that you can be saved. You can begin to walk with him in this very intimate and loving relationship, the one who knows you better than you even know yourself, that you can begin to walk in the freedom and newness of life that Jesus offered. If that's you this morning, you know, we talked about a connection card, Joel and Jeff did. And at the bottom of that, if you don't have a relationship with the Lord or he's not your shepherd and you just want somebody to talk to about that, I want to extend just an invitation of myself. You check that box off, myself or our lead pastor, Joel, we would love to talk, get up with you, maybe have a cup of coffee or some lunch and just talk about what that looks like. Making that decision of having Jesus Christ be your shepherd. And then my second question as we close that I want to pose to you guys is just think through what, what lies or accusations have you been lending your attention to here at the table over the last week or month or maybe year? Just think personally in your own life. What lies or accusation have you been putting your trust in and allowing that to define you? knowing that this beautiful table has been set that the lover of your soul the creator the author and perfecter of your faith has invited you to come and to sit to be restored and love on how can you allow the enemy to not have a seat at your table what are some of those lies or accusations that you are believing in fix your eyes on the one who is greater than all your circumstances. Fix your eyes on the great I am. Gone are the days of us just believing the lies of the enemy, or better yet, gone are the days, I'm telling myself, of believing, like what I think about myself does not hold weight in comparison to what he thinks about me. Right? Like if what I think about myself don't align up with what he says that I am, who he says that I am, go on with that thought. I'm done with it. The table is set and has been prepared for you by the Father in the presence of all the circumstances and struggles we find ourselves in. And this is a table where we can find rest and be restored and have peace. The enemy desires to have a seat at the table. Let's be a people where we don't let him. Resist him and he'll flee from you. Let's pray. God, we are so, so grateful that, God, we can have hope and joy even in the midst of the trying, most trying times in our lives because, God, you have prepared this table for us in the presence of all of the negativity and all of the hardship that we may face. God, you invite us to come and dine, to be refreshed, to be loved on, and to be restored. And God, I realize that a lot of us, myself included, we have walked into this auditorium this morning bogged down by a lot of things. But God, can you remind us this morning that you're greater than it all? God, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. God, can you help us to remain fixated on you, that our thoughts will remain on you, that we would trust in you. Lord, meet us right where we are. And I pray, God, that in this most intimate time that you said that you create, that, that we would be just
just reminded of our sonship and our daughtership and like our identity of who you called and that we would walk and live our lives solely out of that and nothing else. We're done with believing the lies. We're done with believing the things that we even think about ourselves that don't align with you. And God, we put our hope and our trust sincerely in you. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for watching. If you want to know more about our church, if you want to join a group, join a team, give online, visit us in person, you can find all of it at threecreekschurch.com. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.